Okay. Welcome to the Genealogy Radio Show and the radio show that's keeping you in the loop. This week, we're very lucky to have Michael Keane with us and Michael Christopher Keane on his new book on the Crosbys of Cork, Kerry, Leash and Leinster. Bards, imposters, landlords, politicians, aeronauts and newspapers. So we really have a wonderful uh, show today and welcome, Michael. Thank you very much indeed, Lorna. Nice to hear from you. Great. And uh, delighted to see that you've got some benefits out of uh, the COVID pandemic. You've managed to publish another wonderful book. Well, thank you, Lorna. Um, yes, uh, COVID brought an awful lot of hardship to an awful lot of people. But the one thing it gave one an opportunity to do was to tidy up uh, long-standing projects when you couldn't do anything else. So that's what I embarked on. And um, it got me through COVID, I must say. That's you know, fantastic. And come here, good. tell us yeah. all about your new publication and the, the Macrossans, Bards of the O'Moors of Leash, the Imposters and Landlords. You know, tell us, yeah, tell us um, the story. Yeah, um, well, if I go back to the beginnings, maybe, Lorna, this all started from me when I retired about a decade ago. And um, I took, uh, for the first time, really, a bit of an interest in my own family tree. And um, one thing led to another. And to my great surprise, I now have published three books with no plan to publish any book. So um, it started for me with a, an aspect of my family tree involving um, a great grandmother down in North Kerry. All my uh, ancestors really were nearly tenant farmers, pretty well all of them in North Kerry. And one of the families there were the McAvoy's, small tenant farmers like all the rest. Uh, but they always had a family story that they were originally transplanted from County Leash. And the McAvoy's were one of the seven leading clans of Leash, always known as the seven seps of Leash. Now, that story wouldn't have got anywhere, but for the fact that by total coincidence, my late mother-in-law was Cathy McAvoy from Leash. So I began to take an interest in the, the McAvoy's on the Leash side because they were my in-laws on, on my mother-in-law's side and my Kerry McAvoy's. And that all led to the publication of my first book. I thought I might do a little article because there were seven clans of Leash and they unfortunately were forced to transplant to North Kerry when Leash was planted and became Queen's County back in the second half of the 1500s. And the, 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 just the, on the family names, um, the clan names, there were Moores, uh, Kellys, Lawlers, Dowlings, Dorans, Devies, or who became Dees in Kerry, and McAvoy's. And I became aware that all around my home parishes in North Kerry, that there was an abundance of all these surnames, and that the people locally, pretty well without exception, I would say, had no idea of their ancient leash origins. So I thought it would be a nice idea to get the story together, uh, which I did. And um, it got too long to be an article, and so it became a book titled From Leash to Kerry. Now, that was launched in uh, 2016. And uh, the story of the transplantation really involved two characters, Patrick and John Crosby, who organized the transplantation and became the big landlords of um, North Kerry and were the landlords to the Leash transplantees who were their tenants. And the Crosby story, as I went into it, what was their story, became more and more extraordinary. They had represented themselves as, um, as English um, gentry from a place called Great Crosby in Lancashire. But the reality is there were nothing of the sort. There were really two um, Macrossans. Now, the Macrossans were the bards to the, the O'Moors of Leash, who were the leading sept in Leash, and the bards to the O'Connors of Offaly, and they had their own territory around Ballyfin in County Leash. And what happened was that two uh, children of the Macrossans were fostered to the new English um, landlords in Leash, the leading one of which uh, were, were the Cosbys, not Crosby with an R, but Cosby, C-O-S-B-Y. And so they were fostered with the Cosbys who um, took over the whole area surrounding Stradbally County Leash 
back in the uh, uh, second half of the 1500s and became the leading family in Leash. And um, these two Macrossan children were educated by the Cosbys and lo and behold, couldn't become Cosbys, I suppose, but changed their name to Crosby, as close as one could get and represented themselves as, as English. Now, they were very well educated. Um, the younger brother, John, became a Protestant bishop, and he was Bishop of Artfert, which effectively, you could say, was Kerry for 20 years, 1601 to 1621. And his older brother, Patrick, became a very senior, um, what we would call a civil servant, but he was in charge of land and the redistribution of land that was forfeited to the crown, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I. And um, he became an enormous landowner uh, throughout uh, North Kerry and throughout Munster, really. And he also got a big estate directly from Queen Elizabeth in Leash and built Crosby Castle on it in Ballyfane, which was back in their home place, in fact. Crosby Castle isn't there anymore. So that was the origins of the Crosbys as big landlords um, in North Kerry and landlords to my ancient ancestors, I suppose. So that's how it all started, Lorna. That's fantastic. And you know what's amazing about this, that the Cosbys foster because they aren't known to be terribly fond of the Irish. In fact, we were just talking about it before the show started about the hanging tree and all the, the different aspects that are going on there. So that's very interesting indeed to have a look at the different things and the different and what what complexity is going on there. But your your book of the the Crosbys is absolutely brilliant, and you're looking at the Crosbys from Cromwell to 1700. What what impact had Cromwell on the for the Crosbys, or did it is that an influence? Oh, huge, Lorna. Yeah, um, you see the Crosbys in North Kerry uh, had all the best farmland in Kerry, really, because the, the good farmland is up in North Kerry, and they owned it. Uh, uh, along with actually the Fitzmorrises. Uh, you remember you interviewed Martin Moore some weeks ago, maybe Lorna, and he had the story of that's the right. They were in, they were intermarried with the Fitzmorrises, and they had uh, most of the good land of Kerry really between them. Um, now the the whole period of the, all the violence in Ireland, say from the mid fifteen hundreds until. Um, Post Battle of the Boyne, I suppose, when the English ascendancy took over and had everybody crushed. Um, the, the Crosbys in Kerry were there through all of that, including Cromwell, as you mentioned. And they had this remarkable facility in order to hold on to their land that they were always sort of uh, fighting on both sides so that there would be somebody who would be on the winning side. And uh, if you take the period of Cromwell now and the Catholic Confederacy uprising, the sons of the two that I mentioned, Patrick and John Crosby, uh, uh, their sons and heirs, Sir Pierce Crosby was the son, the son of uh, Patrick Crosby, and he owned a uh, north of the land. And David Crosby was the son of the bishop, Bishop John Crosby. And when it came to Cromwell and the Catholic Confederacy uprising, they were on opposite sides. Sir Pierce was on the Catholic side, fighting against um, the, the, the Cromwellians, we'll say and David was on the Cromwellian side. And David won, of course, and Sir Pierce uh, died during the middle of the whole thing. And um, he died in prison, actually. And um, David had the estate restored fully to him, all the Crosby lands, signed personally by Oliver, with a lot of annotations by, in, his, in his own handwriting by Oliver on the, 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 the contract. So that's how they became established. But then we had the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, and lo and behold, the Crosbys were on, um, trying to be on both sides again. Basically, I suppose, to try to hold on to their land and make sure whichever side won, they'd, they'd have a, a foot in the door. So um, they were Protestants, really, but they supported King James against um, William of Orange. But when William was successful, they managed to um, get themselves re-established as Protestants who were supporting William to an extraordinary kind of an achievement in one way. And so they managed to hold on to their land. Yes, they were very adroit. And, very and adroit, a, a lot yeah. of families were like that, though. They were making sure that they had a Catholic branch and a Protestant branch oh, because yes, yeah. it wasn't really certain which way it would go, especially Absolutely. with the Stuart crown. 
and what's going on there as well. So Protestantism is a relatively new phenomenon in the in the 16th yeah. century, of course, and it's not as traditional or as well established as as uh, Catholicism or uh, and so on. So things things really do change at the drop of a hat and it isn't unheard of to have that time it's very political religion is very political at this time so it is important to know that i see you've got patrick crosby imposter and landlord so tell us a little bit about patrick then patrick well i i, I just met patrick there he was the eldest brother that was fostered so he was an impo- he was an imposter. Well, he was. He was the- really he was really a Macrossan uh, and a bard, an Irish bard. Uh, that was his family background. Oh yes, so that's just wonderful. Oh, him, so just well- representing himself as a as an English um, uh, fantastic uh, with the name uh, with the name Crosby. Nothing at all to do with. There is a place called Great Crosby in Lancashire, and he just and he and John. Uh, Pretended. I see you have some sex scandals here. They're always good for the radio. So uh, What's this, Lorna? the sex scandal originated with the discovery by Reverend Crosby of letters exchanged between his wife and Lord Melbourne. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was uh, well, sure. Everyone, uh, this family is, um, you know, they're stretched down to the present day, 500 years. And no good family like that wouldn't be uh, there without having a few good skeletons in the cupboard. So this was one of the one of a number of the, of the Crosbys. What happened was one of them was Reverend William Crosby. Now the, their names were nearly always William or John, and not James as well. You know the way the names keep going through the generations. And Reverend William um, married uh, a very glamorous lady in Dublin, Elizabeth Latouche, who was they were the leading banking family in Dublin. Were enormously wealthy. They owned uh, Marley Park and Milltown and all that. They were the Lord Milltowns. But anyway, um, what happened was that marriage was fine, I suppose, except that it wasn't fine because uh, Elizabeth had an affair with Lord Melbourne, who was the Lord Lieutenant in Ireland at the time. And um, I think that was that's what he was. But he later went to be went on to be the prime minister in England, very close to Queen Victoria. And um, the Reverend William took the extraordinary route of starting a high court action uh, charging uh, Lord Melbourne with what at the time was nicely uh, called um, criminal conversation, which everybody knew what it actually meant. And uh, the high court action was to be heard. But what happened was that um, the witnesses that were supposed to appear that um, Reverend William had lined up, strangely, all disappeared. And uh, everybody knew what was going on. They disappeared because they were well rewarded not to show up. <laughs> That's brilliant. Uh, so no, he Reverend, didn't, Reverend did he William get his wasn't. satisfaction? Did he lose his case? He the, the case, the hearing never took place. But Reverend William, um, you see, he would probably continue with it. But uh, uh, he, was, he, he would have dropped the case if um, they would arrange for him to become a bishop. Now, that was nearly a step too far because, um, I mean, you know, that got into church politics. But what they did really is then nicely and quietly um, gave a nice remuneration to Reverend William as well. So in the end, everybody was um, bought off. And it had to happen, really, because Lord Melbourne was, was on his way to being Prime Minister of England, of the United Kingdom, I suppose I should say properly. And um, if, if big sex scandals about him appeared at that time, um, you know, his, his political career would be in total jeopardy. Uh, now, that wasn't his only affair. He had a fairly <laughs> racy reputation. But um, that was the, 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 the big, um, one of the big scandals associated with the Crosbys. One of them, uh, that, was one of, that was the most high profile one, certainly. And we have the future prime minister of the United States. I know, I know we're going to move on to part two today as well. So we'll, we'll just certainly divide this show into part one and part two. And this is part one. And because uh, we've got so much to cover. The Danish silver robbery scandal. Yeah, this was another um, extraordinary story. There was a Danish um, ship uh, which was laden with silver uh, that had come across the Atlantic and... Um, the ship foundered um, in, in, in uh, northwest Kerry, the, the homeland of the Crosbys. And um, 
the, it, it, the, 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 the Danish sailors and the, the captain, who was actually Norwegian, were in danger of being lost at sea. But the Crosbys, um, right, at, at the, right beside their Ballyhide Castle, was the, one of the Crosby mansions, um, very close to Ballyhide Castle. The Crosbys managed to rescue the lot. And they brought in all the silver and held it in the, the, the basement of Ballyhide Castle, guarded by the Danes themselves. But what happened really was that um, the locals, of course, were aware of everything that was going on. And one dark night, um, about 200 locals with their faces blackened uh, swarmed uh, onto the Ballyhide Castle and uh, killed a couple of the Danes and grabbed all the silver and made off with a lot of it. And um, this is a, a great story down in that part of Kerry, uh, because the full story, uh, as people say down there a little bit, has still never been told, because there's still silver hoarded here and there, maybe, that people would be ke keeping quiet about. Um, now, um, the big story, though, related to it was where the Crosbys themselves uh, secretly part of this capturing of the silver. And a lot of suggestions are that maybe they were. Now, the, 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 the head of the family at the time um, actually died, um, and they blamed it on his exposure due to the rescue of the Danes. But his wife, uh, Lady Anne, uh, who was a very clever and able lady, um, uh, was um, very nice to the Danes and everything, but uh, there's a strong suspicion that she maybe had a, had a strong part in, in, in organizing the capture of the silver as well and got her reward for it. Uh, she had claimed a lot from the Danes because of not looking after them, and they were, they were reluctant, I think, to pay her what she was looking for. And so they thought of another way of getting rewarded, and that's the story. It still has rever reverberations down in that part of the country to the present day. And you might still see wonderful um, silver. It was melted down, really, and um, made good use of, I suppose. And some people became... Uh, instantly maybe a good bit wealthier than they were before in that part of the country. Uh, there were um, great trials afterwards and um, they transferred those charged, including a Crosby uh, to Dublin because they said that, that they wouldn't um, get a fair hearing in Kerry. The reason being that the Crosbys were wonderfully good at marrying everybody in every big house. They married into nearly every big house in Kerry and the jury at the time would, would be laden with Crosby cousins. So they transferred it to Dublin uh, because they thought there might be an independent fair hearing there. But it, the case collapsed there as well, partly because the Crosbys were so powerful politically. They commanded always nearly four seats in the Irish House of Commons, and then the, some, they became the Earls of Landor with a seat in the Irish House of Lords. And so they were, they were a powerful lot, really, um, starting from the very humble beginnings that we mentioned. And this is true across the board. Marriage is used as a, a means of negotiation for genealogists who are looking yeah. at power and prestige. And it's not just for the upper classes. The repetitive marriages happen to create alliances and forge networks that happen for centuries and decades and are really important in Irish history. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to finish for part one for our show and I'm just going to stop recording and thank you for listening folks and the show will be podcast out at seven um, at, in the afternoon on Sundays and also airs live from Radio Corkabashkin in beautiful Kilkee. So thank you, Mike, for your Michael, for your first part on your book. And we're going to go into our second part for the following week.